It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and your host, Chris Larry. And welcome back to another episode of It's Just Business. I am once again not Chris Larry. He's just frankly being lazy. You know, that's really what it is. Um, no, he's not being lazy. He's on vacation uh, this week. So we will have our super sub Alex for yet another episode. You have to put up with him. And then the regular guy, Chris, will be back. Alex, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I guess Chris, I'm assuming Chris is at his place in the Borscht Belt again up there in the Catskills. Well, I think he's uh, so, sort of permanently up there, so I think what he means this time is he's somewhere on a real vacation. Oh, oh, oh. So he left his vacation home for another vacation. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think that's what it is, because he's, 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 I don't, I don't think they have a place in Manhattan. No, no, anymore. no. Well, he was in, uh, he wasn't in Manhattan, he was in one of the other boroughs, but. It's all the uh, same, man. It's all just New York. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, <laughs> no, I think and, it was but, maybe in Brooklyn, though. Yeah, you're right, yeah. though. <laughs> Uh, it, it is funny, you know, my family did the same thing for many, many years where they had a place up at, you know, the Adirondacks and they just rented places in the city because you couldn't afford to buy in the city. Uh, that's like what my grandparents did. That's why I have the summer house I have now. I, I mean, so. honestly, I don't know why anybody would want to live in New York City. I really don't. It's a nice place to visit. I'm not even talking about politics. I hate their politics. I'm not even talking about that. But I don't know why you would want to have such a huge enormous living expenses bill to have to live in the city unless you really had to. I don't well, understand it. Well, it. it's jobs in the end. I think, you know, that's the real reason. Um, you know, pe- people go where there are jobs, and there's always work in New York. I guess, but, I mean, living in Manhattan, I mean, if it were me, I would rather live two hours away in the middle of New Jersey and commute rather than spend a fortune. That would be me. Well, the commute itself is a fortune. Uh, it, it's like twenty bucks to take the tunnel every day. You know, like it, it's insane. What? The oh, is it really? Eat. It's that much? Yup, <clears throat> yup. There's not like a I, monthly I, way to. I, I don't know if there's a monthly. I just know every time I've drove, driven through that tunnel, it's twenty bucks. Better yet, like just that. stay away from New York. That's 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 always the answer. It's always good. Just don't move somewhere it, else. It, it it's a crazy expensive place. I mean, so is DC. So is like San Francisco. San Francisco, like there's eight or nine cities now that what it costs to live in a major metropolitan area versus even a place like Houston, it's insane. You know, Houston like, is not even in the remotely in the same stratosphere ballpark. as any of that. Oh no, no, no. Houston's a very low cost of living. Yeah. Um, so bottom yeah. line is, move away from those cities. And only if you're left leaning, don't please don't come to Texas. We don't want you here. But anywhere else is probably fine. Um. Okay, so we're going to hit start our business, sports and law and business related topics here. We are once again doing an Alex and Steve uh, broadcast marathon today with the Hogstye coming up later. Um, so yep. we will see if we can talk for two hours without ruining our voices. Um, we're going to start with another episode of Athletes Behaving Badly today. And I'm kind of sort of glad, Chris hates the Athletes Behaving Badly segments and so it's actually probably fortunate that alex is here for these because he doesn't mind talking about athletes screwing up and in this case we're talking about richard sermon now richard sermon has a reputation um as being sort of one of the good guys he's well spoken he went to stanford i don't agree with a lot of what he says but what he but he's he presents himself well now well, and he's one of the first guys to pioneer the whole to be your own agent concept, right? Like he was one of the early guys in that. I think. I'm not sure. I'll th- I don't know. I'll take your word for that. I'm not. I, sure I feel if that's like true. he was. Like he he negotiated one of his own contracts early on, and people yeah. like that's never been done. Because if you don't know out there, I mean, how athlete uh, agents make their money is they take a percentage of the contracts yeah. that they negotiate, and 4%, so percent something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it's six percent, but I wouldn't. I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> Um, that it is, but it's certainly in that neighborhood somewhere. So if you negotiate your own contract, you're saving, you know, that amount. Um, but in this case, Richard Sherman has now a whole slew of criminal charges following him. Yep. And this just, just goes to show, this is one of these things that, you know, if you don't truly know the athlete on a personal level, you don't really know who they are. That's sort of what we learned here. Um, now, so the charges are this. Two counts 
of missed oh shoot it's it's all the, there's two separate incidents here i'm gonna pull up another thing while right. i'm talking here but there's two separate totally separate incidents one is has to do with what happened at his in-laws house and the other has to do with drunk driving so there's two separate things here now this happened last thursday last week last thursday so he's charged with uh misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor criminal trespass uh, malicious mischief and then driving under the influence and resisting arrest um, now the the um, the former charges come with domestic violence designations because this had to do with his in-laws which makes it more difficult so what happened here apparently is that Richard was very drunk and, and uh, when you say very drunk, very, very drunk is what it sounds like. Yeah, not a little drunk, a lot drunk. And was sending, I, apparently sending text messages out to various people um, threatening to commit suicide. Right. Um, you know, let's certainly hope that that was hyperbole and not, he's not in that kind of mental state. I certainly hope, but we don't know. But that's part of the fact pattern. So he shows up at the in-law's house and is screaming at them through the door. Um Come out here, Ray. Apparently, the father-in-law's name's Ray. Come out, come, you know, come through me, Ray. Come, you know, uh, things like that. And then he starts to try to beat down the front door. Uh, does that on two separate occasions, which is probably where you're getting the the two mischief, criminal mischief charges. Is probably because he did it twice. Um, right. The father-in-law never came out. Nobody came out. Nobody was ever hurt. And so then he leaves. <laughs> and of course, he's very drunk. And so he then apparently almost hits construction workers runs into some sort of construction type stuff going on on the side of the road this is where the drunk driving charges right. come from he hit he hits a barrier with his car <laughs> yeah. yeah as a matter of fact i think i'm getting wrong i think that happened first and then he showed up at the house i think is what happened because right, after right. he that left the house sense. yeah um the wife his wife expressly told the cops he's not armed please don't shoot him and so um, they ended up having to use a police dog on him to get him because he res resisted arrest and apparently that they didn't feel that the taser was safe um, given his proximity to them and well uh, I, I read that his father-in-law had sprayed him with pepper spray well in the yeah face. I was getting to that yeah that was yeah. the other thing is he had pepper spray and so between those two things they were afraid about the safety of the uh, taser so they released the dog on him to get him down so it was a mm -hmm. huge whole mess so the drunk driving thing happened first um right so he now it, he's it, and that's at like 1 a.m and he's arrested at six this is a bad like five hours of like yeah for him. yeah it, this is not a short event now he's really fortunate he's in this happened in king county washington um, right. because King County, Washington are run by extremely left leaning political leadership and their prosecutors up there, uh, frankly, just haven't been doing their jobs. To be honest, they've, they've arrest that the police up in King County have arrested thousands, hundreds of Antifa members over the past year who've been rioting and the prosecutors just let them go without charging them with anything. And this is sort of King County's. Um, modus operandi when it comes to criminal trial. If he had been in like, you know, the middle of Texas, this would go a totally different way for him. But he's fortunate that he's in King County because the judge. Well, he'd probably have just been shot in the middle of Texas. You know, they wouldn't. Well, have maybe even, he wouldn't have I made mean, it to the court. Certainly, he would not have been charged with four misdemeanors. These would have been felonies. The judge let him go without bail, which is amazing to me. And so he's released on his own recognizance. That's just incredible to me. <laughs> Um, I can't well, imagine. He, let, any let's other... also keep in mind he won a Super Bowl for the Seahawks, so they're going to be very lenient towards their one of well, their fan I favorite think it's players. Less that and more just that these prosecutors shouldn't be prosecuting. It to, to be honest, um, and I don't think there's too many other jurisdictions in the country that would let anybody go on their own recognizance based on, especially when Richard Sherman has the money to go hire a private jet and fly off to Tahiti and never to be found again if he wanted to. But regardless, that's where we are. So, um, so now we wait. Yeah. So the, so that's the fact pattern. The big question then becomes what happens to him from a football perspective. Um, 
Well, he's a free agent still, right? He's not on a, any roster. Yeah, true, but you have to think that absent this, somebody would be willing to sign Richard Sherman, but I'm not sure now. Well, I, I mean, look, uh, he's... I don't remember. His, he's hes up there in age. Inter- like, I, I've kind he's of looked at Richard... Hmm? He's 33, drafted in 2011. Right, but he's been on the backside of his career for a couple of years now. Absolutely, like, I, I absolutely. don't think that he's he he might be on some lists of hey, if our stars get hurt and we need to add you know good depth, you, you know he's probably on a couple lists there for teams and probably still is. Like I don't, you don't care about this if you're a team if you're just signing Richard Sherman to be your backup somewhere, you know like this isn't to the level of what Quentin Dunbar did last offseason or anything like that. Uh, so, you know, like, I don't think it would help, but I don't see this as some kind of PR nightmare. Most teams are will still take a Richard Sherman, you know, even well, after he drank on... two... He, he, supposedly, by the way, uh, just because I found this fascinating, his wife claimed he drank a full bottle of vodka and a full bottle of whiskey before this happened. I've never been a drinker. But that sounds That's, like a ton of alcohol. That is a ton of alcohol. That like is alcohol a you should be dead t- level amount of alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, like alcohol poisoning level yes. levels. Now he's a big guy, obviously, and maybe he has an extremely high tolerance. I don't know how he's even walking, you know, drinking that much alcohol. Um, but in terms of Zinovelker, I mean, to me, Richard Sherman's marketplace is like contender who wants to bring in somebody t- a lot of veteran savvy uh, to sort of get you over the hump to the Super Bowl. I don't think like. The Jacksonville Jaguars are going to bring in Richard Sherman, for example. No, 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 no. He he's that kind of he he'd be the perfect guy for like Bill Belichick and his classic. I'm going to bring this guy in for a year and just use him and lose him. Yeah, like, that's okay. Exactly. But yeah. with this hanging over him, um, basically nobody's going to sign him until it's resolved because the NFL would have if he was if he if he signs a contract, I think the NFL will immediately put him on the commissioner's exempt list. At least they Possibly. should. Not possibly. They have to in something like this. Um, now, from a criminal perspective, again, it's certainly because he's up in King County, Washington. As odd as this sounds, this is the type of criminal charge that typically, when you have expensive defense lawyers especially, will typically get reduced to probably two charges. You'll probably reduce the four domestic violence and criminal mischief related charge the four charges from at the house to one probably plead to like criminal mischief without a domestic violence designation and then he may have to plead to the dui (laughs) and he'll get probation he will not get prison time probably suspended license for the dui yes yeah and then that'll probably be it you know again it really helps that he's in washington but um, because nobody's hurt here, this is one of these things that sounds a lot worse. In, in the world of criminal stuff, it sounds a lot worse than it is. Right. You know, because there's no real violence here. Um, it, it sounds like his problems are maybe in his more in his own head than they are ultimately with the law. I don't think this is not a situation where you're going to see Richard Sherman go to prison for a year or anything like that. All this, the, Most of these charges are going to get dropped. He'll cut a deal, and that'll be that. It, the judge will probably send him to alcohol awareness class. It's probably standard, I would assume. Standard in Texas, so I'm assuming standard in Washington also. Um, yeah, his, I, Apparently his wife showed up with him Friday at the arraignment. So yeah. they're, you know, because she it, doesn't it, want the money to go away either. I, so I don't know. We don't really know, like, where this stems from. I heard it had something to do with his kids were at the father-in-law's house, and, you know, he didn't want his kids at the father like. Those details still are murky as to, like, the actual catalyst, you know, like, and and he says he's suffering from depression and all this stuff, which, you know, he might be, but... He was apparently taking antidepressants, that's in the fact pattern. By the way, I read, there's, you can, I don't have one particular story, this is all over the news, you want to look it up, you can Google it, it'll come up instantly. And I don't know what antidepressants, but I imagine there are certain antidepressants that don't mix well with a bottle of vodka and a bottle of whiskey. Which is you also know? a depressant as a drug, yeah. by the way. So, you know, you're sort of evening your, <laughs> you're, you're right. eliminating the effect of the antidepressant by well, drinking it, two bottles of That's called self-medicating. Alcohol. A lot yeah. of people who suffer from depression and stuff like that self-medicate. <laughs> right, but if you're taking them at the same time, you're sort of right. eliminating the impact 
that the antidepressant drug is supposed to have on you by taking depressants at the same time. That doesn't right, really mix well. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I, I suspect that at the end of the day, his problems are going to be more personal than than legal. Right. Um, and I, he, you know, it's we're already in the middle of July, so this won't be wrapped up before training camp. Um, but if he really tried and he hires the right lawyers, I bet you they could probably get this wrapped up before the season starts. So I suspect yeah. um, that top a plea deal. That, that's what that's what you're gonna. Do. Yeah, and again, I, I, if it were me, I would having done some of this stuff before in a state that actually cares about crime. And even in Texas, they'll drop a bunch of these charges. So I suspect he'll plead to a DUI, plead to one of the mischief charges without domestic violence designation, and it'll be over for him. He'll be on probation. He can't drive in the state of Washington. You know, so what? It'll go away. And then the NFL will probably suspend him for four games. That would be my guess. So if he signs a contract, I would think he'd probably be out for weeks one through four, and then all will be magically well like nothing happened. Well, I, I mean, it does sound to me like this is a guy in the back end of his career who, <laughs> if he's to be believed, those are some early signs of CTE right there. You know, if he's already got the manic depressive thing and, Possibly, you know, yeah. anger, clear anger issues, you know. Because we've over heard of something. this kind of thing before, you know, many, many times. Yeah. So, yeah, that it makes – that's that went through my head. Um, you know, it made me wonder if he's an alcoholic uh, you know, that went through my head. There's no evidence sure. of that. I'm not accusing him of it. I'm just saying that's one thing that sort of went through my head. Uh, it goes to show two things to me, Alex. I don't know your thoughts, but my thoughts are, one, you don't really know athletes unless you know them. Sure. You know, and the other thing is this is an example of what can happen. Like you said, it could be CTE. Um, it could be a case of a guy having a ton of problems that – the NFL is just ignored because he's been an outstanding player on the field. Right. You know, it's, right. it's, um, he definitely screwed up, but sort of the, generally speaking, it's sad. I blame him. It's just his fault for sure. Don't misunderstand. Him. This is his fault, but mm. it's generally speaking, it's sad that to see this sort of thing happen, you know? Oh yeah. It's always sad to see this happen. Um, you know, and unfortunately I, I think we've seen this with a number of players over the years. Uh, more than you and I can count. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, a lot of times stuff like this also gets swept under the rug with a lot of guys. Uh, you know, even you go back 20 years, if Richard Sherman had done this 20 years ago, I don't think we it gets publicized. You know, it, it you might hear something, but uh, you're not going to get the detail that we have now about all this. Listen, a drunk John Riggins called Justice Sandra Day O'Connor Sandy Baby right. in the middle of a formal dinner. Right. And that's not violent, but that shows he had an alcohol problem that everybody kind of laughed it off and thought it was funny. Right, you know, because it was the then. 80s. Everyone had an alcohol problem. <laughs> yeah, but that's also sad. Uh, you yeah. know, you shouldn't be that intoxicated at a formal dinner unless the only reason you would be is if you have an alcohol problem. I mean, John Riggins was drinking on the sidelines during games back in the day, man. Like, and that you saw that. Like, it it, it wasn't. I hidden. don't. I don't remember that. I don't remember him drinking on the sidelines in games. Or I, I, I that. that's always been a story, really. And it's really that he was drinking during halftime. Like, he would go back in the locker room yeah. and have a beer. And he's not the only one that said that. Also, by the way, there's been others that have talked about that, and, well, and yeah. basketball players have talked about that. Um. Uh, you know that that's certainly not you know like Dennis Rodman used to talk about that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I believe Sean Taylor and and uh, Santana Moss talked about like I think having a shot of Hennessy or something before these games. Yeah, you know, yeah, Clinton that was kind of like a tradition between the Miami guys. I think yeah, they would have a and shot Clinton, before a game. Right, and Clinton Portis is involved in this. <laughs> so yeah. if you're a Richard Sherman fan out there, I would be more concerned with his mental state than I would his legal state. Because I just don't think is it, it, this is the kind of thing that looks worse to the public than it probably is to the law. Because the public, this is also part of the problem generally with the media analyzing every single criminal stop that's ever happened. You know, nowadays because the public doesn't have the capacity to understand uh, what's really going on in these videos. You just don't. The public just doesn't understand 
the intricacies of criminal law and police um, procedures and they don't understand the kind of things that happen and this is an example of that so I mean in the world of criminal law this is pretty minor except for the DUI and frankly I hate to say this Alex but I mean I think you probably know this most jurisdictions are pretty are far too lenient on DUIs and if you get the oh, first absolutely. one usually it just goes away you know and I, it, I think it, you know even though you and I are very like you know I like to drink you don't drink and we're on different sides there you, you know that I've always kind of said I would come down like a ton if it were up to me one DUI you wouldn't get your license back ever it would be like a flat I, I would go hard line hard line I, so, I agree with you and I even was in a prosecutor's office and in Texas and even in a jurisdiction like that it took two three or four DUIs normally not two it took three or four DUIs before you'd really be able to crack down on these guys usually the yeah. first couple more or less go away um, right. which just mind boggling if that happens in Texas just think of what well, it liberal Washington me in is going to do. Place like Texas, because you also aren't really known for having a good non-driving infrastructure there. Like, if you don't have a car in Texas, you're kind of boned. You know, like oh, so you can't what? get around a lot of Texas without a car. So, yeah, I mean, I, well, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> yeah, that's a key reason why we don't come down harder on uh, drunk driving uh, in most of the country. Is I- I've never known that to be in Texas known that to be a factor. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying I've in Texas I've not seen that as a consideration. No, I'm talking as a like larger sociological like when I when I've had these discussions in political science classes a million years ago that always comes up. It's I mean, like I'm well, not, what what do people supposed to do if they can't drive? And my answer is I don't care. So what? Let they can figure it out. That's not my problem. It's their problem by drinking and driving. That's my answer. Who cares? Sure, but in I'm Richard just saying Sherman's it, case, he can afford be, to have mm-hmm. a driver full time on staff anyway. In yeah. Richard, so it wouldn't matter. But like your average person, yeah, don't drink and drive, man. Too bad for you. Sucks to be you. If you need to walk, I guess you need to walk. Or I mean, it, I find day. it. I, I've always found it fascinating that guys like Richard Sherman, because Sherman had a couple huge contracts, right? He didn't even have just one. He, he had, had three or four. Huge contracts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you could pay a buddy to be a, like, six-figure driver for you, like, he, and you're fine for the rest of your life. You, I don't understand why any NFL player would ever get a DUI. <laughs> I, yeah. Once they've made that big payday, I, Once I don't they've made any, Listen, the minimum salary... In the NFL, I think it's four hundred forty thousand yeah. dollars a year. Okay, if you're on an NFL, even a practice squatter is making mid one hundreds, you know, yeah. and up. You know, I think it worked out to one hundred eighty seven thousand maybe last year. And granted, is you it know, up that's, to that much? Wow. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's not a small amount of money, and so at a bare minimum, that's not wealthy, but that's certainly upper middle class. You could afford an Uber everywhere, right. <laughs> you know. And, well, and if you're frank, making four hundred forty thousand, one eighty-seven is teetering on one percent as is. Yeah, you know, like it's up there. I think the one percent mark is two hundred fifty now. Is it okay? I yeah. mean, so certainly it's upper middle class at the bare minimum. So there's no reason ever driving. If you're on an NFL roster, on an active roster, making four hundred forty thousand and up, right. get a driver, hire a limo. Yeah get a driver for the night there's no reason for this ever well so. i mean and you're always living in major cities uber uber is pretty cheap <laughs> yeah you know? exactly or a taxi or you know if you yeah. don't like uber do a taxi or whatever so i have no zero sympathy for the drunk driving thing um but i just and and by the way on the richard sherman part like i don't i think i might have said this earlier but his wife stuck with him his wife showed up in court with him on friday right. um you could the the cynic in me says she just doesn't want the money to go away. The optimist would say she recognizes that her husband has problems and is sticking with him. Who knows? We'll never know. You know well, that's their business. The, the other factor in that is I don't know if this is a issue with him and his wife or is this an issue with him and his father-in-law? Because uh, from the little that's been reported about that side, it sounds like it's him versus the father-in-law. That's the problem. And the other option to be this is Richard Sherman versus Richard Sherman. Yeah. Yeah, of course. But yeah. You, we'll never know. I mean, Steve, you've had in-laws. Sometimes it doesn't go smoothly. You know that. No, I, I realize that, but yeah. 
my point is that's the other option, and sure. we'll never know. Could just be Richard Sherman's got mental problems that it he needs be. to figure out. Um, yeah, I mean, so, we're we're seeing a lot of that. More more and more guys are starting to be more open about mental health issues. Now it's always in uh, surround like with him, it's around this. With Aaron Rodgers, it's around his fight with the Packers. It's always around something else that it comes up. But we're starting to see that come up more and more with people uh, that they're willing to say, "Look, I'm not feeling right in the head." I believe Kevin Love. Yeah, I think it, you know came out and talked about his mental problems a few of uh, his mental conditions a few years ago. I think it was anxiety. I may be getting it wrong, but I know it was Kevin Love, and mm-hmm. and he became open about it. And so there's one, and so yeah, I think um, the stigma is still there, but people are becoming more open about it, as you said. Yeah, <laughs> you which know? is a good thing overall, even though there is a stigma to it. It's better to say, "Hey, look, I'm not right here." And by the way, in, ter- for, in terms of um, Richard Sherman's response, he released a Maoist struggle session apology, you know, email to the world, um, which typically means really nothing. He's got to get his head right. We'll see. There's going to be more of the story because we're going to see the the results of the criminal stuff one way or the other, and I suspect we're going to hear more about him. You know, if he's got an alcohol problem, we'll hear about it. Um, but like you said, he's not signed to a roster right now, so we'll yeah. see. He's got to resolve all this fairly quickly to get on an NFL roster. That's for yeah, sure. and you know, like like we, I said in the beginning, he's not old, old, but thirty three cornerback, and he's a physical guy. Like his, his odds of being on an NFL roster were getting pretty low anyway, and that could also be playing into the mental problems. You spent your entire life superstar, and now no one wants you. You know, like th- that's a big thing. Well, it's, yes, I mean, you know, these NFL guys are, you know, public figures one day, heroes to some, and then the next day it's over, you know, and I think a lot of people have difficulty with that, and uh, I think that that's why a lot of them end up having alcohol problems and health problems and they gain weight and all of that. The people who do the best have their future lined up already, whether it's in media or something else, (laughs) Uh, and, and... I'll just use Kobe Bryant as an example. Rest in peace. Um, you know, he started a movie company. If you guys don't know, he was he started a media company before he retired. And like that, like he won an Oscar with this little short film that was called Dear Basketball. It was sort of how like his public retirement. Right, now, right. But I he was that. but he was working on animation films and stuff. And I don't know what happened to the company now that he's passed away, but point is he had his future lined up and it was going to be a smooth transition for him because he had something to do. You know, it's these guys that all that, you know, hang on too long in the NFL, um, uh, you know, because they don't really know what to do with their lives. And that's when you get into problems. And it's possible that this is what Richard Sherman's facing. I think you have a valid point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and it feels like NFL players more than anybody this happens, you know, uh, like they, they don't have that plan. And maybe it's just because the stop in the NFL is so much quicker than the other sports, you know? Yeah. But even like that, like, you know, like Scotty Pippen's gotten a ton of problems over the years, you know, right. retired Chicago bull and he's never really done anything. And, uh, you know, he's trying I, to start something up, I think, and it's not going well. Right. He, and he, he, he stepped, he stepped on a couple of landmines. Yeah, and that's just an example. There's a hundred examples. That's just who popped into my head, but there's a a lot of examples of that. Um, So you really, like Clinton Portis, this is probably another one. He's gotten in trouble when he's, since he's been retired. We did a story on this show a year ago about his criminal problems, which to my knowledge are still pending. Um, You know, he could be in, he's, he could go to prison. You know, the federal, newsflash, federal prosecutors almost never lose because they have more uh, resources than you do, no matter who you are. So he's he's got problems, you know, and and that's what these athletes face, and and it's sort of the the old classic story, and this is the same thing that veterans face in this country, by the way, because um, once the NFL's done, once you're done, the NFL's kind of done with you, and yeah, they may they pretend, care. no, they may pretend like they care about the rights of veterans and stuff. Um, but the, but it's really just a loss leader for him, and that's what happens with the with military veterans, you know, mm-hmm. with the Department of. This is why partly why the Department of Veterans Affairs is so screwed up because nobody really cares about it because you're not an asset anymore, and it, you know you're not helping anything. So who cares? And that's sort of what the NFL 
in a retired sports star's face is that. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I think that is actually a pretty interesting uh, parallel <laughs> there that you it's bring It's kind of the same, right? I mean, the money yeah. is not there, but it's sort of the same. It's like, what do I do? You know, here we right. are. Right. And, and, you know, the resources aren't there because, again, the government doesn't care about you anymore. You're not helping. You know, you're not supporting the cause. And the NFL doesn't care. Look at Wilbur Marshall. Look at the struggles, the health struggles. He's, Wilbur Marshall, if you don't know, I'm talking about the Chicago Bears, 1985 Bears, middle linebacker uh, from the classic 85 Bears team. He's had a ton of health problems. Yeah. Very, very serious. Mike Ditka's talked about it in public. Um, he's in no small part responsible for uh, whatever health benefits retired NFL players now have. A lot of it stems from his efforts. But he's had serious, serious problems. And for years he couldn't get any help. You know, and that's what they face. Because, again, who cares about Wilbur Marshall? You're not helping us anymore. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah, it's not – it sucks that that's how they're treated. But you also got to kind of point the finger at the players' union that they're not doing their job there. Because that is why they're there, you know? Yeah, well, the NFL players' union, I think, is a weak union. Right, yeah, we've talked about that before. Yeah, and, um, yeah, they've made progress over the years with these retired – you know retired benefits but again it, it's it's within the struggles of a handful that have done it not like mm-hmm. the union as a whole wilbur yeah. marshall and he's not the only one there's been others but he's probably the i think george facer. always comes to mind because didn't he lose everything and have to live in his car or something like that there yeah, was like, uh i don't know if he, i know, I know he, he had problems his money at one point yeah i don't know about the living in the car part i'll take your word for it i don't remember that but but yes he's another one yeah, it was a big public face of it and went through struggles yeah. and all of that. I mean, um, when you're talking about guys who were on the cover of Madden and that level of, you know, face of the league, and then they're broke, it's it's bad, man. Well, yeah, well, look, I mean, look at Adrian Peterson. You know, when he, he I mean, you know, he got sued by some private equity investing comp- investor you know, to pay back like a, I think it was a fourteen million dollar loan. I think it right. was. That's part of why he's still playing is he's trying to pay off that as much as he can. And that means that he squandered all his money through somehow and doesn't have it anymore. You know, and that's you're right. That's why he's playing. That's still why. He's, that's why he's still playing. So all that to say to wrap this up. Um, certainly, this is Richard Sherman's fault. He needs to man up and take responsibility for his actions, but I suspect there's probably more underlying co- underlying stuff going on here than we really realize from in his family dynamic, uh, his mental state, all of that. I think, frankly, the criminal stuff is probably the, the least of his problems, would be my guess. So we'll see. Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to stick with the NFL, though, but we're going to move on um, to another NFL story. Um and this just makes me just shake my head. It's this falls into the get woke go broke scenario to to quote um, Clay Travis. So this is from Front Office Sports, dated July fourteenth. Michael McCarthy, who's a guy we've done a lot of his stories here. Um, this is called NFL to roll out more social justice messaging in the two thousand twenty one season. So apparently, uh, now to go back here um, a couple of years, the NFL swore that they were going to. The NFL made a commitment to the Players Union to put $250 million in over 10 years to combat what what they called uh, systematic racism. And this was a deal they cut with the NFL Players Union. So part of that is apparently for the 2021 season going to be on the field signage, decals on helmets, in-stadium PSAs, and they're apparently going to play the song Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh they're going to make that a prominent part of all big league events, according to this story. Now, I'm not African-American. My African-American friends have told me that that song is apparently used in, like, historically black college uh, yeah, you know, and universities, in, and that is apparently a, a prominent cultural song. I'll take their word for it. it it's I, I, kind of it becoming this, like, second national anthem thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, apparently, that is going to happen now. All this, in from my perspective, all this is going to do is piss off half the country, and it, you know the NFL is going to lose audience because of it. They don't have; they sort of have a they have a contractual obligation to do this stuff, I guess, and this is why they're doing it. But um, this falls into the category, Alex, to me of the, all sports need to remember 
that at the end of the day they're entertainment and if they want to attract the most and widest audience they need to get away from this garbage all any political messaging and just stick to entertainment that's how to attract an audience and the nfl and the nba just don't understand it well i i would counter that with you know look if you want to commit yourself to fighting social justice as the nfl uh you like not last time i was on here but before that i was on the show and we had discussed a story about they found out that the insurance companies were shortchanging African-American players because of some calculus they did saying, well, African-Americans have lower IQs, so they can't. Oh, yeah. Let me stop you right there yeah, yeah. real fast. So what he's talking about that we did that, I don't know, a few months ago, and there was a lawsuit, and I can't remember who brought it, but what the gist of it was was <laughs> that – It was bought the, by players, I think. It was, and, and the this wasn't really the NFL. This was their third-party – Insurance, insurance company, companies yeah. doing this and like some actual, you know, insurance actuarial types were implementing a formula wherein they were calculating the baseline cognitive abilities of players by race right. specifically. And they were giving African-Americans a lower baseline cognitive rating than they were other players. And somehow one of the player, a couple of players figured this out and sued the NFL over it. And that's just a case of, objective racism. racism it's it, objective that, racism yes. yeah but that's what i but go ahead. if if you actually want to do stuff about racism in this country and social justice spend more time finding things like that because there's probably a lot of that going on in your third party stuff even in your own offices that you don't see work on that figure that out first because that'll actually make a difference in the long run more than look Everyone wants to end racism. Writing end racism in the back of your end zone, the only people who don't want to end racism are racist. Beat that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I may have to bleep that out because bad language. But, yeah, so this is the problem. I don't think, you know, there's a small handful of people out there who would be against, would you know, believe in racism. And, and the, the people who are that are the people who wear white hoods, you know, and are burning crosses. <laughs> but the problem here is the defin the, the the definition of things like racism and supremacy have been bastardized and turned on their head and i don't really want to make this a critical race theory lecture but that stems from marxism marxist theory and sort of what's happening here is that the public we're taking traditional definitions of things like of the term terms like racism and turning into something that they traditionally haven't been. And so while I think all reasonable people, you know, the bulk, vast bulk of society would certainly agree that, you know, we don't want anybody to be racist. The problem is what a segment of society views as, as the definition of racism and it's not what everybody else does. And so you get things like NFL social justice messaging and putting Black Lives Matter all over the place. Well, that means different things to different people. And... um Again, all it's going to do is cause controversy and irritate people more than help. That's well, I mean. I mean, I would disagree with you that – because the definition of racism changes every generation. Uh, you know, you go back a century and, you know, it, it was considered progressive at that point to say, hey, let's actually let blacks learn how to read and allow them to have public schools. Uh, even though if you want to keep them separate, that was fine. That was a century ago. You know, you go back further, it was like the progressive thing was don't just wipe out the Indians, at least give them a reservation. You know, like put them somewhere, don't just kill everybody. That was considered progressive. You know, like the definition of what we consider the line, it always moves. So I'm not worried about that aspect of our I'm tremendously right now. worried about it. And I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I don't, I really don't want to have a huge discussion on the sports business show about this in that respect, because I think we're going to delve into areas that are, not appropriate for a sports business show. Sure. Uh, you know, the point here is to me, I'm making is this, and maybe we need, I've thought about starting another show, Alex, maybe we ought to do that <laughs> where we can get more into the politics of this. The point here is that the NFL apparently is going to get, is, is going to get heavy into the social justice messaging in the 2021 season. Um, with a variety of things. I think you're going to see the NFL becoming the, what the NBA was in 2020. Probably. That's sort of where we're going with it. And the NBA lost a huge amount of their audience as a result of it. 
and that's going to happen with the NFL most likely this year if they go down that road. Now they might not drop off like the NBA did because the NBA has other problems, but they're going to. I can almost. I, I bet my life that the ratings will be lower as a result of this because, like I've always said, your entertainment. If you're an in, and if you're an entertainment product in the entertainment industry stay away from causes and just entertain and that's how to build your brand well i point. mean look it, it it is entertainment sure but they've you know they've gone back and forth on different causes throughout their history it's of all the stupid well don't go, go don't don't advocate for causes just enter if football is an escape people want watch football largely because they want to get away from everyday struggles and just be entertained for a couple hours watching a football game. You know, um, that's a problem. Now, along these lines, the other half of this NFL story, which I'll go ahead and introduce here now, is that something I didn't know, um, I, I just can't believe I didn't know this, but I didn't know this. Apparently, the NFL also has a PAC, which is Political Action Committee. Right. Um, now and, we're getting into my world. All right. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't realize the NFL had a pack. This is called the Gridiron Pack. It was launched in 2008. I saw this in a story, again, on Front Office Sports from right. July 16th, Justin Byers, called Why the NFL Formed Its Own Pack. Uh, and now, again, there's not really anything new here. This is just Front Office Sports realized this. Right. And, <laughs> you and know, and wrote a by story the way, about why it. They form- because everyone has a pack. Like, it, it's kind of surprising me that they didn't have one before 2008, honestly. Yeah, the, and Major League Baseball has a pack, and yeah. and so they're advocate that this is their arm where they can do political fundraising, and they're going to, you know, reach out and touch state and federal legislatures it's to advocate. All federal. Uh, I, I've been looking into it. Yeah, it's it is most yes yeah, mostly, but you know, this is their arm to go advocate for things that will help the NFL. Uh, but yeah, this is um, Alex has been involved in this world. Uh, for a long time, so yes. Alex, your thoughts? Well, my whole life. <laughs> let's let's put start starting as a baby, uh, you know, because my father's been in politics and all that stuff. So I know that world pretty well. So I dug into the NFL's gridiron pack and just you know who they've been giving money to, and it shouldn't surprise anybody. They are a classic. We play both sides org. I mean, that's what any major corporation does now. Um, the amount of money they give is. A lot lower than I would think, given, you know, who the NFL is and, you know, it's this 800-pound grill that we always talk about. You know, they they gave, uh, I think it was 160-something thousand to both Democrats and Republicans in 2020. So you know the your story talk- on front office sports says that they spent two point four four million on lobbying during the two thousand nineteen right. twenty congressional. That's how much they spent on lobbying. I'm talking how much they actually give. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. and then it says the league dispersed four hundred eighty thousand in contributions to campaigns, parties, and other packs. Right, right. So four eighty. It was by the way. So the only thing I found really interesting looking at the you know election year by election year numbers. Last season was the only time they've ever given an exact same amount to both Democrats and Republicans in the 2020 really, election. Exactly, huh? Hmm? Yep. They're exactly. So Down they're trying to, the to play both sides. Every other year, it's – and it went back and forth, which is not surprising. It was like 20 uh, – during presidential elections, they went more towards Republicans. Non-presidential, they went more towards Democrats. Uh, but it was usually less than a 60-40 split. So, you know, it's pretty even. Um, so that was interesting to kind of look at. The, the one name that kept popping up that they were given the most money to, though, Steve Scalise, uh, who is the Republican minority whip right now. But they've been giving him money a long time, I think even before he was whip. And I kind of dug in to figure out, well, why would you give this guy money? Uh, and if you don't know, he is on the Energy and Commerce Committee. So he has oversight on uh, commerce, on telecom, and on uh, – investigations in those things so it makes a lot of sense that the they would be giving a lot of money to a guy who could be you know investigating them for dirty stuff if he really this wanted. Is, uh please don't haul us in front of congress in front of a committee to make us testify right bribe. or if you do be our friend <laughs> yeah because you, know? you know this is what i think irritates a lot of people about politics because it's really just legalized bribery yes. basically absolutely 
more or less that's what it is and you know there's like the nfl is intentionally giving the same amount of money or roughly the same amount of money to republicans and democrats because they're trying to curry favor on both sides right and, and they're they not really advocating the right people like steve scalise they yeah. give a lot of money to pelosi because she's the majority leader for example that kind of stuff yeah and and they're they're not really trying to better the political landscape of the United States are trying to curry favor for pol- from politicians from all, all, every side right. in order to help themselves. Which, right. I, I, within, they're doing within the bounds of the law, and we're not saying they're doing anything wrong. Um, they aren't. Legally in terms- wrong, no. Morally right. wrong, I think everyone thinks, you know, this kind of lobbying is questionable at times. But <laughs> Most PACs are yeah. totally sleazy. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. I, I, and, you know, in all my life of working in politics, I've never worked for a PAC for a reason. Uh, one, I'm not a lawyer, so I have no value to them. I'm not a prostitute, so I have no value to them. Uh, You're not a prostitute? <laughs> oh, do, do you know the original term lobbyist comes from prostitution? I didn't know that. In the early 1800s, uh, the lobby that people talk about was actually a lounge behind where the Congress would meet, and it's where their uh, escorts and those types types of women would hang out and wait for the congressmen to get off work so that they could to talk to them about, oh, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Because they're getting paid on the back end by corporations. I didn't know that. Yep. Someday out there, if you guys want to entertain yourselves, Google Teddy Kennedy, Senator Ted Kennedy and Sandwich and read that story. Oh, yeah. Uh, look, <laughs> there, there's a side to politics that's super seedy. Like people are not in politics because they're good people. They're good. They're in politics because they're power hungry sleazeballs. For the yeah, most of course. Part. Of course. <laughs> no, um, most politicians are not good people. No, no. They're mo- terrible. Mo- they're mo- horrible most wealthy beings. people are not good people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like th- there's a reason people rise to the top. And it's not by being a good person. Um, no, they're utter and total sleazeballs on both sides of it for the most part. For, yeah, so and, anyway, yeah. the point is the NFL has a pack. That was what the story well, says. I had one more tidbit I found that I thought, thought would be yeah, funny. Yeah, please. Looking at the funding and where all their money's going, like I said, it's mostly gone pretty even split to the, the. And by the way, I don't think they ever donate to either presidential candidate, which is interesting. The, that is kind of interesting. I, yeah. I, I never, I didn't find one donation to Trump listed or to Obama, uh, Obama, Clinton. Well, yeah, none of that. Um, I did find they've given fifteen thousand dollars to another pack called the Northside's Good Government Fund Pack. Now, Steve, I'm going to bet you a thousand Hogstein nickels that you can't tell me what the Northside Good Government Fund Pack actually is a lobbyist group guess. for. Hmm? I could only guess, and I'd probably be wrong, so let me know. It is a liquor lobby that focuses on the state of Indiana. Why are they giving money to a liquor lobby that focuses on the state of Indiana? I can only assume it has to do with Jim Irsay, and maybe they're trying to keep him out of trouble or something. Yeah, who has a chemical dependency problem yes. and got a DUI. Yes, because they've given $15,000 to that pack uh, three times in the last, or over three different election cycles, $5,000 each. It's either that or one of their owners is somehow involved in this. Yeah. But, you know, again, it would probably be Ursay because Ursay. it's Indiana. <laughs> Which is sadly ironic. Yeah. <laughs> considering yeah. who he is. Yeah. Uh, the, so yeah that's that is, a weird one. Yeah, that is a weird one. And, you know, what's that going to really get them? You know, not much. But, see, the thing is, they're not spending public funds here. So they want to light money on fire like that. Sure. You know, be my guest. Who cares? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't get upset about that. It's, that is either. kind of – that's a funny one. That is it, it's just funny. so random that it's like, why are you giving money to some liquor – board you know <laughs> what is it called again the north side what yeah okay the north side's good government fund pack which has n- you would never think that has to do with booze because <laughs> they couldn't just say we're the booze at the alcohol advocacy pack right 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 would give them money. I, well i would respect them more if they just said what they were <laughs> yeah just be honest <laughs> yeah I would yeah. definitely respect that more. Don't yeah. tell me you're talking about good government when what you're really advocating for is like increased, you know, broader sales of alcohol or l- right, right. restrictions Relax on the licensing laws or something. I don't know yeah. Indiana liquor politics, you know. Or in the case of Jim Irsay, it's get me chemicals and alcohol easy in easier fashion. Right, you know? right. He really just wants uh, the Drizzly app to be, you know, following him around somehow. That's what it is. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Yeah. So point here's the point. If you didn't think the NFL is involved in politics, you are mistaken. 
Of course. If you thought the NFL is in politics for altruistic reasons because they want to make the world a better place, you're mistaken. What they're doing here is they're advocating for things that help the NFL. That's they're the way of politics. They're just playing the game like everybody else. That's just what politics is. Politics is sleazy, dirty, ugly, and awful, especially yeah. at the higher levels. You know, it's it's less sleazy and dirty and awful at the local levels. The higher you go, the more awful it is. And that's what the NFL is giving money to, is the awful side of it. To well, help I, I would actually argue in my experience in politics, the sleaziest is the state level. But, you know, like local, yeah, I agree. Local's usually the cleanest, but I've worked and it's in mainly all three. They don't have a lot of money. I found state to be the dirtiest. <laughs> yeah, at, at local level, there's not a lot of money to get too no, sleazy no, for no, the most no. part. <laughs> No. It's like the people who run for the school board and stuff. It's hard to get too corrupt. There are know, the occasional sleazy. I mean, you do get sleazy yeah. backroom deals at all levels, but right, but it's know. less. Yeah, it's but, usually hey, we want to build a you know a factory here. What will you give us? You know that. Well, kind of yeah, thing. and and, and to Alex's point, it's like for, as an example, there's never been a non-corrupt Illinois state politician. Oh yeah, yeah, they're all corrupt. All of them from Illinois. You know, like Rod Bl- Blagovich went to prison. Uh, you know, he was the governor. Uh, you know, and there's, you know, the, the Daly family. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on and on in, in Illinois, especially Chicago. It happens at every in every state. Illinois just somehow either they're the worst at hiding it or they're just, you know, the worst overall. Because it's, yeah. pro- it's a mix of them, too. It really is. And you're not going to convince me that there's an honest politician from the state of Illinois. It's oh, no, I'm not going to try. But I, I'll tell you there's not an honest politician in Texas. There's not an honest politician here in Maryland or in Virginia. There's there, not an honest politician anywhere. No, no. They they all have to go that route at some point. It, it, I, I will say, benefit of the doubt, most people start out honest. They just get corrupted, and it's really just a matter of how many election cycles does it take to get dirty. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, that's really the truth of it. Okay, since we have a couple minutes left here, um, I want to just get one last tiny thing out here. And this is sort of an update on the sports betting market. Um, and so this is, uh, I saw this also, this is a front office sports day here. I saw this on front office sports, uh, sports betting market to grow $28 billion by 2025 at Abigail Gentrop. Um, so there's, there's an investment by a company called ARK Invest. Estimates that U.S. sports betting will hit 37 billion by 225 by 2025, which is apparently now the industry is at about 9.5 billion. So they're talking about more than tripling the sports betting market in the next four years, which would make a lot of sense. I don't think that's a good thing. I think that's a horrible thing. But if you look at things, for example, in Washington, Dan Snyder trying to get a betting license, right? Uh, to got agreements from whatever wherever he puts the stadium basically he has a license you know Maryland more or said, less we'll yeah give you one Virginia yeah. said we'll give you one DC said we'll give you one you know and he's not nearly the only one and right. so what we're gonna see are a much closer ties to the sports betting industry um, and the sports professional sports industry than we've ever seen before years ago if you go back 20 years there was a firm dividing line and sp- professional sports intentionally wanted to stay out of it for the integrity of the sport. And basically what's happened here um, is they've just given up on the integrity of the sport argument in favor well, of I think $37 billion. Dollars. <laughs> that's what it's what's come that? down to. They don't have any more integrity. It, yeah, know. that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's – yes, better said is that there is yeah. no sports – there's no integrity anymore. And, and they just couldn't keep turning down the money. So um, you're going to see it more and more and more. I don't think it's really ultimately good for sports and good for the leagues to be this in bed with Absolutely gambling. Absolutely not. It, it's, you know, in ter- if you love sports for sports and not for gambling, it's terrible. You know, it's funny because I think all organizations go through a lifespan. And you can say this about countries, too. Mm-hmm. You use the Roman Empire as an example. It built up from nothing. It conquered the world. And it eventually ate itself because of people fighting over power and money in politics right. and it went away and and there's a lifespan to every country every industry and every company and i think what we may be seeing in terms of this may be the turning point this gambling may be the turning point for some of our professional sports leagues because i just don't think that you can 
maintain the integrity of these sports and be this in bed with gambling. So what you may see is start to see a downturn in in the popularity of some of these sports. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm not talking in the next two years, but maybe in the next decade, you, you might not see the NFL be quite as prominent anymore because well, again I think there's you're a lifespan starting to see that um yes. and th- there is a broader philosophical discussion there um and i'm reminded yeah, of uh we'll save I, that for the political yeah you know. well it reminds you what you said reminds me of something i read in a sci-fi book and by the way if you ever want real good theories in politics and read science fiction it, it that stuff's the best at co- predicting the future but just start yeah. with kurt vonnegut alone. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're, they're one of the things I remember reading was economies rise, economies fall, and when they die, the new economies form. You know, like th- that kind of concept is what you're talking about. Um, when it comes to the betting, I don't think that – I think that what they're seeing this as, as the lifeline. I, I mean the, the death and uh, – the thing that's going to kill them is the internet. You know, the NFL and major – they're all dependent on TV contracts, and that's how you make – most of your money in all these sports now is your TV deals. TV is going to go the way of the wheelbarrow or the the covered wagon, not the wheel. Well, they're still weird, but wheelbarrows. Yeah, but, it was a, kind of an odd analogy. <laughs> but yes. So the cover, you know, the covered wagon was very important for a long time. Car comes along, kills it off. TV is doing that right now because of the internet. They're not, they'll get big deals from Amazon and stuff like that, but. I don't think that it's going to be quite the same. I don't. I don't see the money being there because the cost to do stuff on the internet's much cheaper in the end. You know. Well, like, I think that's. I think it's the problem more is that there's a lot more things to look at because people are still going to have monitors on their wall that are broadcasting stuff. It's just going to be from different companies and in different formats. And so, in that regard, you can still put the sports on the wall in somebody's living room. Uh, but the problem, real problem, is that there's so many other things to watch that I think young people of today are not as interested in s- televised sports because there's so many other things well, that can distract them. Well, it takes a long them. time. We have shorter attention spans. There's all that. Yes. We also have to remember the concept of professional sports isn't that old. You know, like you go back to the 18th century and the 19th century, there were no professional sports. There, People played sports for fun, but... You know, major like, league baseball was really the first major professional sport. Right, right. Uh, maybe boxing too, horse racing. But oh, I'm those talking were about team concept. sports. Yeah, 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 boxing certainly yes. Yeah, but in terms of team sports, it was really major league baseball in the right. late 1800s. Right, and then soccer at the same time over right. in Europe. You know, those yes. and everything rose at the same time. Late 1800s. You know, suddenly we got interested in this idea of professional sport, but. You know, the norm through most of human history, other than, like, roaming gladiators to the 1800s, professional sports weren't a thing. You know, it was an amateur thing you did for fun. So we could be, you know, like you said, seeing the end of that cycle of the concept of professional athletics just kind of is going to go by the wayside at some point. Yeah, and the reason why I said it is I don't think you can have such a close marriage of – gambling and professional sports and still maintain the integrity right, of the sport. because that's the word from within, of course. Yeah, right. And so if you compare it to, if you use my rise and fall the Roman Empire analogy mm-hmm. here, Every I think this, does that. this is the tipping point where it's going to go into the fall part because you just can't have integrity and have so much money involved. At some point it's going to go haywire and then the public loses confidence in it and doesn't want to support it anymore and then it sort of implodes. And that's what happens to societies and that's what's going to happen and it's what happens to industries and that's what's going to happen to sports. And I think we may be seeing the first signs every, of it. Everything has a life cycle. Every country yes. is going to go through. You know, like oh, yeah. I, you know, I always get bemused by people like who talk about what's the United States going to be like in a thousand years sometimes because I'm like – It's think, not going to exist in a thousand yeah, years. Yeah, of course. No, right no country going, that exists ex- today will be around in a thousand years. At the rate we're going, it might not exist in ten years. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> you know, you'd never know. It, it could. Right. It could not. But – you know, the longest empire was a 2,000-year Egyptian empire, and that's because no one else had anything to do. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you yeah, know. basically. Yeah. And that's totally gone now, yeah, by of the course, way. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, so all this to say, because yeah. we're out of time here, we could babble. Alex and I could definitely babble on about this for hours. Um, 
because it's just interesting, but we're also getting away from sports a little bit. So um, the bottom line is we're going to see maybe a tripling of the mayor, a tripling of the financial value of the marriage between sports and gambling, and that's probably not good in the end. Yeah, and so, then the house of cards will come tumbling down at some point. Exactly right. Yep. And with that, we have reached the end of our hour with with, with uh, it's just business. Please, um, you know, continue to watch and listen to all things that we're producing on the Hogsty uh, on the Hogsty Network. Generally, we have the Hogsty Show, which we are going to record here in a couple minutes for next week. The training camp's coming around the bend, yep. and we have all of our normal written content. So stay tuned, and we will see you guys next time. Later. <laughs>